The next item of business is topical questions, and at question number one, I call Sandesh Gohani. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its current policy is regarding the deletion or retention of WhatsApp messages by Ministers. Deputy First Minister. I would refer to my statement to this chamber on the 31st of October last year. The policy regarding deletion or retention of WhatsApp messages is set out in the Scottish Government's well-established and overarching records management policy and supplemented by the mobile messaging apps guidance. I would reiterate that the Scottish Government does not routinely use WhatsApp for decision-making or to provide advice to ministers. In the event WhatsApp were used for such a purpose, the information would be retained for the corporate record in line with existing Scottish Government guidance and policy. Sandish Gohani. So I want to declare an interest as a practising NHS GP. As a GP, I worked on the front lines during the pandemic. My priority was always to look after my patients' health. Yet in contrast, during COVID, the Scottish Government was joking about deleting their WhatsApp messages with one official joking that plausible deniability is my middle name. We know the shameful culture of secrecy came from the very top, with Nicola Sturgeon and John Swinney deleting all their messaging. The same Nicola Sturgeon who stood at the daily briefings with a pretense of moral superiority. And yet behind the scenes, it is clear the Scottish Government was mocking us, yeah. believing none of this would ever come to light. The Government is shameful. How can this Government be trusted by the people of Scotland? Will the Cabinet Secretary take this opportunity to apologise for the behaviour to the people of Scotland? Deputy First Minister. Well, let me say uh, first and foremost, what is important, of course, is that the inquiry is allowed to do its job in scrutinising all of the decision making, the messages, and it's for the inquiry, obviously, to determine if it has concerns about the application of mobile messaging policy or their content, and we should allow them to get on with that. And of course, it is one aspect of the many issues that they're taking evidence on and reflecting upon. And what is important in all of this for those who worked on the front line, those who are the COVID bereaved families, is that lessons are learned from the pandemic to help us prepare better for the future, which is why this government will fully comply with the UK inquiry. And it's of course why we established a separate Scottish inquiry, the only part of the UK to do so. Sandish Gilhani. No apology there. Well, deleting WhatsApp messages wasn't the only skewed priority from the nationalists during the pandemic. Extraordinary minutes from an SNP government cabinet meeting confirmed restarting work on independence and a referendum with the arguments reflecting the experience of the coronavirus crisis, and that was considered at the height of the public health emergency. This shows no matter how serious in situation, nothing will stop the SNP from trying to pursue their political obsession with independence. Perhaps this was amongst the reasons that all electronic messaging was deleted. Can the Cabinet Secretary look the public in the eye and tell them that campaigning for independence and another referendum was the right priority during the height of the pandemic? Deputy First Minister. Well, I think it's pretty clear and is clear that the focus of the Scottish Government was on the pandemic yeah. and on dealing with the issues of the day in relation to the response to the pandemic. And I think uh, looking at all of the information that has been provided to the inquiry uh, will support uh, that position. Um, I should also uh, say uh, to Sandish Gulhani that you know, clearly uh, evidence uh, that is being put in front of the inquiry, the inquiry should be allowed to interrogate that. They will interrogate uh, those who, were core, uh, who are core participants, who were at the front uh, of leadership in the Scottish Government at that time, some of who uh, are no longer in office, some of who are still in office. The inquiry should be allowed to do that. And in the same way, of course, as the inquiry when it was sitting in London 
was interrogating some of the decision making, some of the conversations and chat that happened across social media at the time. Some of that is very uncomfortable, there's no doubt about it. But what's important at the heart of this is that lessons are learned about the decision making on the pandemic so that if it happens again, as it may well do in the future, that lessons are learned to make sure we get the response right and as, as, uh, as, um, as fully uh, compliant and uh, as front-footed as we possibly can, learning the lessons that we are at the moment from the pandemic. Jackie Bailey. Ken Thompson, the man who drafted the Scottish Government's records management policy, was advising people how to avoid complying with it. The National Clinical Director, Jason Leach, who helped shape the COVID regulations, was advising the current First Minister how to avoid the rules. And Nicola Sturgeon, who promised transparency, has alongside John Swinney and senior civil servants deleted WhatsApp messages on an industrial scale. No lessons learnt there, Deputy First Minister. So whether messages were deleted nightly or weekly, it is clear that Jason Leach wiped his messages completely and seemed to find the period during the pandemic all quite funny, judging from the messages we have seen. This isn't just a matter for the inquiry, it's a matter for the Scottish Government too. So if the Scottish Government agrees that Jason Leach's behaviour was inappropriate, is it not time that he was sacked? Deputy First Minister. Well, Jason Leach isn't here to defend himself, as Jackie Bailey knows, and I don't think it's fair to focus in this chamber on any individual. The inquiry is the place that should be allowed to interrogate anyone, whether it's Jason Leach or whether it's the former First Minister, who of course will give evidence, as will the current First Minister. It should be for the inquiry to be able to interrogate the evidence, whether that's on messages or decision making or anything else. In terms of the issue of the frequency of deletion, it's actually not about the frequency of deletion of messages, but rather the importance of capturing any relevant information in line with records management policy. So whether that is on a day-to-day -day basis, a week-to-week -week basis or a month-to-month -month basis, it is important that the information on decision-making and salient points is captured for the records management policy, which is in line, actually, with the Section 61 Code of Practice on Records Management, which was in consultation with the Scottish Information Commissioner that states that information should only be kept as long as it is needed. And provided this duty is met, the medium that contained the information can be deleted. So that was in line with the Scottish Information Commissioners. And as I say, um, anyone who um, the inquiry will have in front of them will be able to put all of these questions. It's important the inquiry is allowed, presiding officer, to get on with its job. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, the Deputy First Minister talks about lessons being learned by this inquiry. Right now, tens of thousands of COVID bereaved families are looking to this inquiry for answers and those lessons. But these are answers and lessons they may be forever denied because despite assurances made to this Parliament and to the national media, it seems that Nicola Sturgeon never had any intention of passing her WhatsApp messages, messages that would have shown the culture and the calculation behind her pandemic response to the inquiry that she knew was sure to follow. Perhaps this is the biggest scandal in the history of devolution, the denial of justice to the bereaved families of the pandemic. So does the Deputy First Minister agree that when she has finished giving her evidence to the inquiry that she should come to this place, to this parliament and explain herself? Deputy First Minister. Well, first of all, uh, the the COVID bereaved families are of course at the heart of this and that is why it is quite right that the inquiry should be pursuing any line of inquiry it wants to whether it's on uh, mobile messaging messages or whether it's on the decision making and that is the role of the inquiry it's why it was established it's also why of course this government established the Scottish COVID inquiry in order to give that additional scrutiny of matters relating to Scotland, not just the UK inquiry. And that was a decision that was made only by the Scottish 
government. In terms of the, the former First Minister's evidence, clearly she has still to give her evidence. Uh, she has also said that there are messages that have been submitted to the inquiry. And I think what we should allow the inquiry to do is to take evidence from those core participants, including the former First Minister, and then we should allow the inquiry to make its judgments uh, about what it has heard. And that, well, I am sure will do so in a very robust manner. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, shouldn't police actually be investigating whether the activities of the message deleting COVID cabal were in breach of the Inquiries Act? Deputy First Minister. Well, of course, that is a matter for Police Scotland to determine if they think that any laws have been broken. Uh, what I am saying today very clearly is that the, the records management policy is very clear about what should be retained and why and what should be put into the records management policy, any salient points, anything around decision making or anything of importance. The records management policy that was developed in consultation with Information Commissioner also sets out when it's appropriate to delete messages. Now, that policy is kept under constant review and uh, any changes to the policy will, of course, uh, be brought forward uh, and Parliament will be made aware of that. But any matters relating uh, to the police or anything else are not a matter uh, for me. They're a matter for Police Scotland. Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Of course, it's not only ministers and civil servants who were watching on TV. When the First Minister asked officials to look into record keeping, did he discover that other officials had also destroyed evidence? If so, how many took that action and destroyed evidence that would be required by the inquiry? Deputy First Minister. Well, as I said, the Scottish Government keeps policies under review and records management will be considered uh, next at the, the next Information Governance Board uh, when it meets this Thursday because, of course, the First Minister had asked the Permanent Secretary to ensure that all steps are being taken to meet the inquiry's requests and the Solicitor General to satisfy herself that the Scottish Government has met all of its legal obligations. That process has uh, concluded uh, and uh, the First Minister uh, has uh, received the assurances that he uh, required, which confirms that in responding to the UK and Scottish COVID inquiries, legal advice has been taken and acted upon uh, appropriately. But as I say, there is, um, the, the policy is kept under constant review and a paper identifying areas for review has been tabled for discussion at the Information Governance Board that meets this week. Question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the closure of Adrossan Harbour's Irish berth for safety reasons after corrosion was reportedly uncovered during an inspection by divers. Minister Fiona Hislop. Uh, firstly, I would like to acknowledge the disruption and concern this issue will have for communities on Arran on top of current weather disruption. Peel Ports, as the Harbour Authority responsible for the port, advised CalMAC to cease operations following routine inspection impacting the MV Alfred, which can only operate to this berth. MV Isle of Arran will remain the main vessel on the route, while the MV Caledonia Isles is out of service for around five weeks for steelwork repairs. I understand that Isle of Arran repairs are expected to be completed today, with updates on services tomorrow due imminently. The secondary route via Clorag Lochranza remains in operation. Trials to allow a freight only service from Troon using MV Alfred are to take place as soon as possible. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that reply. The MV Alfred is unable to operate from Adrossan's Arran berth, despite that vessel supposedly bringing much needed resilience to the route, which cannot happen if she's tied up in air. So I'm pleased that uh, there are further developments in terms of how Alfred will be utilised in the forthcoming days. Now, of course, we found out that the, that, that the MV Isle of Arran has a mechanical failure which has cancelled all sailings to and from Adrossan until at least noon tomorrow. Does the Minister appreciate Islander frustration is at the lack of communication and urgency from the harbour operator, which has been less than forthcoming about the safety concerns identified by the divers, on top of issues with the CalMAC run ferry service? And can she say what information has been shared by Peel Ports with the Scottish Government and its agencies? Minister. 
So clearly it's a responsible for Peel Ports as the harbour operator to conduct um, that communication. However, I can say that contact has primarily been between Calmac and Peel Ports. Uh, Transport Scotland has also been in liaison with Peel Ports to impress on them the urgency of the issue and to understand the extent of the problem. CalMac also met um, on Monday with the Aran Ferry community to understand some of the issues and potential solutions. And I can say that the Isle of Arran was able to uh, take on all the uh, passengers required with the MV Alfred uh, not being available over the weekend. But clearly we need to make sure there are good plans going forward and with birthing trials, weather permitting, for the Isle of Arran after the repairs today, that would provide um, some certainty for the near future. But clearly, um, the additional uh, freight and indeed passengers will need as we go forward in the coming months. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, I thank the Minister for that further response. Trying to get information from Peel Ports last week was try like trying to get blood out of a stone. And there's clearly a breakdown in trust locally with Peel Ports due to its lack of investment in Adrossan Harbour over decades. Does the Minister agree that this episode highlights the urgent need for the Harbour Redevelopment Project? And given the seeming, seemingly endless delays with the latest updated business case due next month, can she provide any information at this point as to when she now envisages redevelopment work beginning on site? Minister. So I would assure you that the Scottish Government remains committed to ensuring that the Arran Ferry Service is fit for the future. And indeed, I, I recall the member asking the First Minister at questions about the extent of the project, because it was looking at the Irish birth, which probably makes sense in terms of uh, some of the most recent developments. Uh, it is essential that the business case for the project is completed in order to have greater certainty of the project costs and the financial package required. Work is ongoing on this, including the output of studies from Peel Ports and from North Ayrshire Council, and we expect to discuss the business case work and options with the partners as soon as this is completed. Katie Clark. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. In a letter to the Adrossan Harbour Task Force in November, it was indicated that improvement works would not include the replacement or strengthening of the Irish berth. Can the Transport Minister confirm whether the outcome of the business case for the redevelopment is still set to be delivered in February? Minister. So I, I hope Katie Clark had the opportunity to, to hear my answer to, to Mr Gibson. But uh, the work on the business case continues. It does include the output of studies from Peel Ports and North Ayrshire Council. And we expect to discuss the business case work and the options with the partners as soon as this is completed. So there are ports still to come in as part of that. In terms of the concern about the extent of the business case, one of the reasons we wanted to, to revisit the business case was to examine the scope of what would be required to make sure there was a sustainable future to um, accommodate what would be required of the address and birth. So I know at the time it was uncomfortable to receive the, the letter um, to the task force, but it was realistic and appropriate to give that certainty that I'm sure everybody wants to see. Question number three, Paul Lucane. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report by Homes for Scotland, highlighting that almost 700,000 households in Scotland are in housing need. Minister Paul McLennan. I welcome the consideration that Homes for Scotland has given this important topic and look forward to discussing it with them soon. The Scottish Government is investing £752 million through the Affordable Housing Supply Programme in 23-24, which includes £60 million national acquisition programme. I continue to work closely with local authorities to ensure local housing needs are met. The Scottish Government has also commissioned research into housing insecurity and hidden homelessness to improve our understanding of people who are homeless but who do not appear in Scotland's official figures. This research will be completed by summer 2024. Paul King. I thank the Minister for that answer and I note his desire to engage. 
with Homes for Scotland, because the results of this extensive survey show for the first time that more than a quarter of households in Scotland are in housing need. That headline covers 185,000 people struggling to afford their house, with 85,000 people living in houses that they can't use because they're not adapted appropriately for disabilities. And I think the report actually masks the day-to-day -day reality of people living in a house that is very, very far from being a decent home. So the reality is that without accurate measurements and understanding what is needed in terms of land supply, we do not stand a chance of meeting the targets that the government have set. So what is the Minister going to do to take urgent action in light of this report to ensure that local authorities have uh, the information they need and are able to feed into the government to provide um, accurate land supply figures that the government can then act on? Minister. Yeah, can I thank the, the member for his question? Uh, I think there's a couple of things I want to mention. Obviously, the figure, uh, the report is based on a sample of just under 14,000 households, which has been extrapolated for the whole of Scotland. And I think in the figure of 700,000 households it actually includes much more than those who require a new home, of course, as, as the member has, has said. And I think the Homes for Scotland report it recognises, and it's on page 15 of the report, when it says that conclusions should not be drawn at 693,000 homes. I require, uh, are required. I met, meet with uh, Homes for Scotland on a regular basis. They're also members of the Housing to 2040 Board, and one of the key things that the Board's been discussing is obviously around about the use of data. So I'm sure this report will, will come up. I will meet with Homes for Scotland soon to discuss uh, the report, uh, and obviously we'll try and make progress in what the recommendations are and what's uh, said in the report. Paul Keane. I, I do have to say, Presiding Officer, that I think that answers another indication of a minister with his head in the sand, because this, result, uh, uh, this report is stark. In the absence of an effective land requirement assessment, Homes for Scotland have gone out and done the work and estimated that a quarter of a million households need a home. So instead of building them, this government is actually slashing our housing supply budget. House starts are falling off a cliff and the housing association sector has already passed judgment on the Scottish government's budget by saying that it is an act of surrender and that actually the cut is going to deal a terrible blow to efforts to tackle child and family poverty. So I say to the Minister that the first step in solving any problem is acknowledging that there is one. So how much more evidence, reports and pleas from organisations will it take for this government to accept that there is a housing emergency of their own making and that serious action needs to be taken now? Minister. Thank you. I think there's a couple of things I think I mentioned, and I'll come back to the question, the answer. We commissioned a report, a research on housing security and hidden homelessness, which I said will report in summer 2024. And again, coming back to, we'll still be investing more than half a billion pounds in affordable homes across Scotland. And of course, I've met with most of Scotland's local authorities to discuss the funding package, to discuss ways we can work with them in that regard. And I'll continue to do so in the next number of months. Miles Briggs. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government's own figures um, have shown that the number of affordable homes started has decreased by 24% in the last quarter from July to September. No one in the housing sector now believes the Scottish Government are on track to meet their housing targets. So can I ask the Minister, what review is being undertaken into these targets which the Government have set? They are really important, as Paul O'Kane has highlighted, to councils and housing associations actually meeting uh, housing demands. And given the number of policies which have destabilised the housing sector, including the rent freeze, and many housing associations reporting that has meant they have had to completely look again at their funding packages for future development, what conversations are now taking place with housing associations to make sure that these projects do take place? Minister. Thank the member for his question. Two, two important points, I, th I think, to member. I mentioned that I meet with housing associations and local authorities on a regular basis. I think there are two things that they've mentioned to me. One is obviously about the macroeconomic situation and where interest rates have sat and where construction inflation has been over the last number of years as well. And speaking to the SFHA, they mentioned that as the biggest barrier that they have is, is the cost of, of borrowing. So hopefully we'll see a reduction in, in interest rates. I think the other key thing in terms of that is also the reduction in, in the, capital, the capital funding that we receive, you know, 10 per cent cut. It, it, we, have to, you know, we have to manage that. So again, I would urge his colleagues in the UK government to look at that and, and try and support us more if, the, if he's really genuine about the point he's made. Yeah. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I think we will clearly recognise uh, that uh, the solution to this problem ultimately has to be to increase dramatically the supply of new house bills. So can I ask what work the Scottish Government is doing to increase house building across all tenures through the use of modern methods of construction, including off-site manufacture? Minister. Yeah, can I thank the member for his question? The Scottish Government supports delivery of homes across Scotland using a range of off-site methods. 
off-site methods from timber frame construction, obviously to full and module uh, development. And we'll continue to do so through our affordable housing supply program. Now, we've, we continue to support proven approaches that balance improvements with value. And I think we'd mentioned that before as part of the rural housing uh, action plans uh, and work with, across uh, the house building sector to deliver the homes that, that we need. I've met with manufacturers of, of, of modular uh, development in the sector and also visited modular build uh, developments and we'll continue to do so. Stephen Kerr. And meanwhile, Edinburgh rent inflation is at 16%, Glasgow rent inflation is at 14%, the highest in the UK, including London. So why didn't the Scottish Government learn the lesson of its own commissioned analysis on rent controls, which are contributing to homelessness? Because that report said that there would be an increase in homelessness. And it also said there would be a restriction in the supply of new housing. Why is the government so tone deaf to its own advisers? Minister. I, I'm glad that, and I'll come back on the point that, 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 that Stephen Kerr mentioned, I'm glad he mentioned about the issue of homelessness. There was a report out last week by Crisis, uh, commissioned uh, and worked with Heriot Watt University, and what they did say about possible increases in homelessness is the biggest impact that has has been the freezing of local housing allowance, mm -hmm. the freezing of local housing allowance, and the freezing of benefits. So they mentioned that as the biggest issue yeah. in terms of the rise in homelessness. Yeah. Again, I wish he would take that up with his UK colleagues in terms of that. Now, the housing bill will be coming forward in due course. I engage with the, the, the PRS sector on a regular basis in terms of that. We need to be building more homes. I acknowledge that in terms of that. But as I said, the biggest Im impact on homelessness, as he's discussed, is on local housing allowance and on the freezing of benefits. I hope he takes that back. I hope he takes that back to his UK government colleagues. That concludes topical questions. Point of order, Jim Fairley. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, under Rule 12.3 committee meetings, it states, a committee shall meet to consider such business on such days and at such times as it may from time to time to decide, time to time decide, subject to any timetable specified in the business programme. Tomorrow, today, we have learned that the convener of the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee has cancelled a Stage 2 debate of the Wildlife and Urban and Management Bill. The cancellation at the beginning of Stage 2 of such an important bill will potentially delay legislation with knock-on effects for the rest of the committee's work programme and other current and forthcoming legislation. A unilateral, a unilateral decision by the convener, without consulting members, to do this is an insult to the hard work of those committee members whose efforts are being undermined by the whims of a convener more interested in playing politics than discharging the functions of his role. Can the presiding officer please advise on what action she and this parliament can take to ensure that the committee meets tomorrow to consider stage two of this important bill? Thank you, Mr Fairley. I'm not aware of the circumstances to, to which you refer, but it is in the first instance a matter for the convener of the committee, and I would suggest in the first instance that you take it up directly with the convener.